I mean, what exactly am I to do with this? I'm console now. Where did that come from? What did I do? Is anyone going to care that a man with barely a scratch on the achievements of his peers is now their leader? It's crazy. I mean, what if I just make a mockery of the position? After that, I won't even be allowed near anything important ever again. And I say that in the stark knowledge that I haven't been near anything important in a while. I mean, why must Constance be allowed to play the hero? If he had sat at home and done nothing, he still would have been made the console. Father was so stubborn, he didn't want to admit he had coddled the wrong child, so he drove that coddling right up to the top of the top. Uh, well, I suppose I shouldn't really worry so much. Julianus was rather clear in his message about Tullus. I'll bear the title, he can bear the weight. Not sure he'll be so willing to help me. But I hear he too is rather in want of glory these days. Is there enough glory around here for both of us? Clearly not, for Constans, with his perennial nose for a good bit of conquest, has disappeared off to more fertile ground. At least I'll be able to enjoy some pomp in Rome now. First consul that city will have seen for a while. With any luck, they'll all be drooling for some gossip on Constans, and I'll fit right in. I might even be able to convince them that he couldn't have done it without me. Which is true, isn't it? Hello and welcome back to Fields of Mars. In the previous episode, Constans was travelling east by sea, but saw heavy losses when he encountered a Macedonian fleet. He defeated them in battle, but a lot of his powerful and elite army was lost. Right after that, we learned of the death of Constantinus, who handed off his consulship both to Constans and to Aurelianus in a new dual leadership system. Constans, now with a reduced army strength, was forced to stop his journey short and go to conquer Macedonia in order to gain new strength before heading east into the empire, and that victory proved to come quite easy thanks to the superior power of his troops. So the Macedonians are defeated at their capital and only region, meaning that Constans now has the option to do what he wants, both with the territory and the faction. He lost one more unit in that battle, a sacrificial unit used as a distraction, if you remember, so that's unfortunate indeed. Now what he chooses to do is subjugate the Macedonians, so what this will achieve is creating a new separatist state. Macedonia comes right back from the dead, but this time with replaced leadership and as a puppet state to us, so they'll represent our interests in the area. And one thing that I haven't mentioned before about puppet states is they also forcibly changed your religion. So you can see they're now Greco-Roman pagans. So this will also help spread our religion in, in the area, name, making it easier if we wanted to in the future to come and conquer this area. They refuse to trade with us, which is a little bit Ready mean considering battle. we have so much power over them. But anyway, this gives a nice opportunity for Constans to start replenishing the units he does still have. And he'll also be able to hire mercenaries and levy troops to expand his army. To the north, there are more territories of area and another Roman separatist faction, the Dacians. It seems that overall the eastern powers have pushed all the way into the eastern Roman Empire, and it's only Roman separatist factions holding out, with the actual official empire basically being nothing at all, just a few troops on a garrison in some island. And on the topic of garrisons on some islands, here we see Tullus moving out to destroy another rebellion near Ajax. Plenty of Celtic separatists seem to keep appearing around here. These islands are extremely unhappy, not necessarily with our rule, but with the amount of immigration coming from every other theatre. As troops, or regular people, sorry, attempt to escape the wars going on in every direction, the islands seem to be getting a lot of immigration, and it's basically annoying everyone, particularly the Celts for some reason, because they keep rising up. Now, in the next time we learn that Tarpia is dead. Tarpia was Constantinus's wife and the mother to uh, now all of the leading officers of our family. She was technically married into another family right at the end, so she doesn't appear in the family tree there, but that leaves all of the brothers now motherless. Julianus, as you can see, has managed to become stepfather to a large number of children of the Eastern Roman Empire's imperial family, which, while right now doesn't do anything because they're all underage, might have some very nice applications, especially politically in the future. 
Constance has a few children of his own, including our faction heir, but of course, they are only mothered by some Caledonian minor noble. No special lineage for them. Uther and Ambrosius Aureliana are still unmarried, and Uther isn't even a legitimate child of Constantinus, reducing his claim to anything. He's a governor of Caledonia right now, I believe. Now Aurelianus needs to swap places with Tullus because Rome is getting uppity, it doesn't have an army to defend it, and they're losing faith in us. So Tullus is going to take the main force to watch over Rome and Aurelianus will have to deal with guarding the islands, both jobs more fitting to their stations and skills anyway. As we reach Rome we can upgrade some of our troops and we can also note that Rome is now flourishing much better than it was under the actual empire. We've upgraded a lot of the stuff and could even further upgrade it but there's just no need to at this point. Point. What I can't do is increase the size of the city because we actually don't have the technological ability to do so. We do have just about enough food to manage having Rome be at one of the bigger cities in the world, but we need to research this tech first. And handily, it's actually available for research right now, so I'm going to switch over and research it because I've been focusing on the military tree the whole time since we haven't really had much need for civil technology so far. But uh, we've gone far enough, so it's time to focus on uh, building up the city that hopefully will come to represent our power in the region. Now Constance, a few turns later, is ready to go. He's levied a load of troops from the Macedonians, so he has some low-quality Macedonian Roman-style troops with him, and of course he's got some mercenaries just to flesh out his ranks, and he's going to start sailing east right towards Constantinopolis. In the end turn, we see the Western Roman Empire flexing their muscles once again. I've mentioned before how they seem to have forces everywhere, and here we see millions of fleets going at it against a fleet that I think is from Mazun, one of the Eastern powers, a satrapy of the Sassanid Empire, probably a puppet state technically. And they attack them, the enemy run away, and that's about the end of that. But once again, a reminder that the Western Roman Empire could do stuff against us if they want to, but apparently they don't want to, so that's nice. And handily, the Eastern powers haven't declared war on us, either so we're just sitting here as a neutral party watching this war go on and it's to our benefit for those two powers to defeat each other in battle so that's all very nice. So Aurelianus moved there back to Carolus to defend it against a potential rebellion, and Constans is able to continue on towards Constantinopolis, and he discovers it finally. We see it's held by Aria, the same power that seems to hold a whole load of Eastern Roman Empire territory. We see an army from Atropatane nearby as well, and there are other puppet states in the region. Basically, the war between the Eastern Roman Empire and the Eastern powers led by the Sassanids appears to have been completely won by the Sassanids alliance. They finally defeated their Roman rivals and now much of Rome's territory is controlled by them. So this presents a bit of a problem for Constans because they are all allied together so attacking any of these guys will call loads of other powers into the war. We can have a look at the diplomacy here. Another thing to note here on the diplomacy map is how far away the capitals are from the front line. These guys have conquered very far. Aria has territory in Italy. That's how far they conquered. They basically controlled the entire eastern portion of the map and Constans is about to piss them off. Such a pleasant sea breeze and on it wafts the scent of barbarians new and old. And with it comes a sense of freedom. For in the sailor's spirit, we can go in any direction we please and find glory in battle and conquest. We can do something rather novel here, something father would have dreamed of. We can liberate Roman lands, slaughter unworthy enemies, collect well-deserved riches, and the only thing that will stop us will be the overflowing joy of the people of Rome and Britannia, who will beg for me to return in victory to champion them as their leader. And their only leader, remember. Aurelianus sits in my chair in Rome, and Julianus sits in my chair in Londinium. Sit on, I say. Achieve nothing, and watch as the people cry out for a hero to sweep them away. Moving on, we see a force of Garamantians raising Sicily, perhaps actually a rare use of raising properly since they can't hold the territory so they're just denying it for everyone, but annoying for us since it's near to our territory and could potentially have been somewhere we take in the future. The Mazun forces land their army near Carolis, so that's highly suspicious because we know they're going to be somewhat hostile to us and a lot more hostile Much in the near future. 
The Western Roman Empire come to me with a peace deal. Did not expect that. Although the fact they haven't attacked us in a long time perhaps suggests this was what they were thinking about. The problem with this is one of prestige because they are slightly higher than us in the strength ranking. So we don't really want to get peace with them until we have proven our dominance over the rest of the Western Roman Empire. You can see I'm trying to make them my puppet state. They do offer me some money in exchange for peace, but the sum is rather paltry in comparison to the wealth we have now. So I'm going to reject it, but not completely reject the idea permanently. We'll keep the idea in mind and perhaps try and organize a more humiliating peace for the Western Roman Empire later on if we can. Now, Carolus wanted to create a force to defend the city and decided that Aurelianus would probably be the first volunteer to lead it, always being hungry for glory. And another individual hungry for glory, Marcus Theodosius, a long forgotten naval commander, can come down to replace him as leader of the local fleet. And he immediately has a chance to make a tiny bit of a name for himself and try and get some of his influence back because there's a Western Roman officer hanging about unguarded out here in the sea. And he can't escape, he almost does, but he's still in range of our fleet. So a chance for an easy victory for Theodosius and a, a chance to show the Western Roman Empire what we mean when we rejected their peace earlier. We still haven't finished with them. They need to become less powerful before we can agree to any deal. Now it's time for some more serious diplomacy. Constans is going to declare war on Aria of the General Sassanid Alliance. And you can see on the right there that there's millions of other powers who will be called into this if we make this declaration of war because they're all intertwined over there. And they all join. Suddenly they all appear on the map. So we can see we're now at war with seven or eight factions, some of which are giant. And we know Aria has conquests all the way into the center of the world map. So of course they probably have a lot of stuff over in the east as well. Overall, this could be difficult, but Constance doesn't care, or in fact the difficulty benefits him, because he needs something difficult to establish more fame for himself. This particular battle, taking Constantinopolis, isn't going to be a challenge at all, because the garrison is small, but I wanted to do it just because it is one of the major cities in the world. Let's take a little look at it. It's actually a little bit hard to do as a port assault because it has very few possible landing points because it's so built up and the enemy can simply defend the one or two places I can land to make sure we can't dodge them or anything like that. But they have, to start the battle at least, deployed a lot of their forces on the walls, which was completely the wrong decision. I guess I could have landed on beaches uh, further down and attacked the walls frontally, which would have been a disastrous, so I'm not sure why they thought I was going to do that. And uh, our advisor is very worried about the fact the enemy apparently outnumbers us, which I think think is completely untrue. I think he's just uh, going off on another crazy moment. Now they have these towers defending one of their little harbours here and I was curious because the towers weren't projecting range markers when I pressed space to show that they could fire at us. So in order to experiment with them I sent a unit of our expendable Macedonian troops forward and indeed the towers didn't fire at us even though the tooltip actually says they will if you hover over those towers which is a bit curious. But anyway at least we discover we can land troops safely over there. Now the main landing point is going to have all of our legionaries on it and the enemy are defending it with one or two units here. We'll start by softening them up with a few javelins. Those horsemen behind can throw javelins as well and they can just about sneak shots over their own men into the legionaries. But not going to do too much damage and of course with three units of legionaries here this is easy enough to overcome the enemy. The main foe here is actually these stairs who proved to be particularly porous. Our troops just go right through them. I think the stairs are just a facade. They're actually standing on the ground below, which you can see on the left of the stairs. Is, you can see where it should be, so don't really know what's going on with these stairs, but proving a little bit of an adversary to our troops. Luckily, they can wade through that concrete and continue the battle. Meanwhile, I'm landing more of the Macedonian forces over here nearer to the walls just to keep the enemy occupied over here so they don't go and actually try and stop my legionaries who, once they break through those first defenders, will have a clear run to the centre of the city. So these Comitatensis spears already having a bit of trouble against the enemy's Jav Cav, and the archers are going to prove problematic as well. These Kurdish archers are pretty good, much better than Roman style archers, using the Eastern Recurve bow, powerful and with a long range, they can do a lot of damage, and this unit of Comitatensis spears here is tasting that damage. They're trying to form the stationary Testudo, but they can't even do it because they're taking losses so quickly from the arrow fire that they're actually trying to just reform into a square shape first before they form the stationary Testudo and unable to do it. They route from that arrow fire, routing forwards into the enemy, disastrous. I guess they're trying to get towards the city gates and ignoring the fact they're running into this melee where some of my legio are fighting with enemy spearmen. 
That fight was going okay, but now the Kurdish archers will switch targets and shoot at the Legio instead, and they're arcing shots right up over their own troops and into my men in some cases, which is very good for them. And immediately, my unit of Legio is destroyed just in a few seconds by that heavy archer fire. So those spearmen will continue on with some nice friendly fire, at least, to reduce their numbers. Another unit of combat intensive spears lost in battle. Thought they were having a good time fighting with enemy cavalry, but not so. I also landed two units of spear cohort nearby to support this attack and they're all we have left all of a sudden they'll have to try and hold the enemy back I ordered those guys, once they defeated the opponents in front of them, which was quite easy, to form a stationary testudo and try and absorb some of that arrow fire, because it is deadly. They're taking their time about actually going into it and standing weirdly in each other's shields while they do it, but while they're in stationary testudo, they're very strong against arrow fire, so that will buy us some time, and we're going to use that time to defeat the one enemy unit standing on the victory point, which is the enemy's commander unit. It's just a unit of generic spears, and we have two units of legionaries very messily fighting with them. They'll win soon enough. Enough. Constans rushing up the main avenue of the city to go and help out with that and be there for the conquest of the victory point. And a couple of units left behind in this plaza to just act as a rear guard to make sure no enemies go and disturb that process. The rest of our troops can fall back to that rear guard as well. We no longer need to fight near the outskirts of the city. And I had one unit of spear cohort stay behind to just absorb all the arrow fire from the Kurdish archers and stop them from advancing. And they're in stationary to studio, which gives them, I think, plus 50% chance of blocking missiles. And they may already have 50% chance of blocking missiles thanks to their big shields and uh, high armor value. Because basically, this arrow fire is doing nothing at all. All of that arrow fire, which was completely destroying our units earlier, is now having no effect on our men as they just stand there and take it, which is great. And the time that's buying us allows constant stands to advance up, hit the enemy spearmen on the victory point, and that causes them to route pretty much right away from the kills and rear attack bonus. So now our men will proceed to capture the city, and we just have to wait for ourselves to win. Captain is having no effect. The arrows just bounce away. We should find another angle. I'll try to get closer. No, keep firing. It's funny, isn't it? Isn't it the fate of mankind to struggle against an immovable foe, yet to fight on? There will be time for poetry later. We must go to the aid of the general before the city is lost. Lives are at stake, sir. Lives? Why be concerned about matters of mortality? Don't you find that to simply sit here, pounding that wall of shields to no effect, gives you a certain... Dark pleasure. Not at all. What's got into you, sir? Those shields will tremble before my ceaseless bombardment. If only I had something bigger than a bow to shoot with. Yes. <laughs> a few minutes later, after the point has been captured and the victory timer runs out, the bombardment of our Testudo continues, and it's had absolutely no effect. Not a single troop was killed by the sustained fire for multiple minutes, even though it was wiping out our troops instantly earlier. Amazing work from this spear cohort and their stationary Testudo. It's won us a victory and the conquest of Constantinopolis. All three of the Macedonian levied units that I brought with me were actually destroyed in that battle. Down to the last man, they took all the casualties for us, which was nice, I guess, since that's what they're for, taking on disposable low-quality units. But I'm sure the Macedonians aren't too happy to learn of this. Anyway, Constantinopolis is now occupied by Constans, and I'm just taking a look around at the situation. Markinopolis to the north has been raised, which is actually quite nice because we can rebuild it and we don't have to worry about someone from there invading. But to the west, Plenty of hostile territory held by these eastern empires, and it's going to be exactly the same thing to the east as well. We're in a very dangerous situation, surrounded by foes, and there's even that Atropatane army on uh, ships there that could come over and land right now if it really wanted to. The city itself, in pretty good condition actually, we'll have to get rid of those churches of course, but the rest of the buildings are pretty decent and it's at a high level of development as well, so we don't need to spend tons of money trying to bring it up to scratch or anything like that. It has some eastern buildings which I think I'll just leave because they actually benefit me quite a lot uh, without having the rest of the province to aid the city, which is handy. I will though convert it over to a Roman style city because it's actually an eastern style city at the moment, and that only means we have a small garrison, so converting it over will give me loads of extra units in the game. 
garrison, and that will eventually allow Constance to actually leave this place and have it be relatively safe. We can also use the local blacksmith to upgrade all our troops there, which is quite nice. Now this new declaration of war uh, is going to reach Tullus and he immediately has something to investigate because we know we now have hostiles at Tarentum and actually their army which conquered it isn't there anymore. So after seeing they only had four units in their garrison also, Tullus decides to advance and simply push them out of Italia so we don't have to worry about it at all. And since this is so far away from the base of power it's unlikely they're going to come back and take revenge for anything like this. We do though discover their army in the sea just outside the city. Luckily for us that army is in terrible condition and it's not all that big anyway and it's poorly composed just loads of generic spears and some mercenary skirmishers really nothing to worry about at all the balance bar is super far in our favor as a result now on the left I actually have an army reinforcing me and I didn't notice this at all until after this fight. We'll look at it in a second. First, Tullus will wipe out these guys. We don't have to siege it because Tullus has an onager, meaning we can just treat this like a normal field battle when it comes to an auto resolve. The losses taken by our troops actually surprisingly high given the balance by. And there's that reinforcement army that I mentioned. It's the Eastern Roman Empire. Finally noticed it. You can't actually see it on the screen. It's off to the right somewhere. So they had a small army in the region apparently which took part in the fight and as for what to do with the city I don't really want to hold it but nor do I want to raise it either so I'm kind of forced to basically occupy it uh, because Tullus is opposed to sacking it that is and what I really thought would be nice here would be to give it to the Eastern Roman Empire but of course you can't do that sort of thing in this game unfortunately but there is a, a possible indirect way to do it because I have no intention of leaving Tullus here to defend this area when he needs to be at Rome. Rome could still be attacked at any time by the Western Romans or barbarians to the north. So I need him back there, if only for public order. So we'll just let Tarentum rebel and possibly the Eastern Roman Empire will find a chance to take it and we'll indirectly give it to them so that they can have stewardship over it. Now who remembers Britannia? <laughs> After a very long time of absolutely nothing happening in Britannia itself, our core provinces, it it's suddenly attacked out of nowhere by the Angles who declared war on us like five years ago in the game. And now finally they're actually going to do something. Their big army with three stacks is actually very poorly suited to a port assault because it's full of war dogs who don't get their dogs in port assault. So that's nice, but the balance bar still looking pretty bad. Either way though, we need to give this a go. Don't we have officers for that? Well no, I can't go myself. Far too risky. They can call for it all they like. Rule number one of strategy is don't lose your strategist. I'll assemble the city guards here and prepare for the worst, sacrificing myself to slow the enemy down for a few hours. Hardly seems like an economic use of the leading military authority in Britannia, does it? And those people in the port towns are hardy folk anyway. Right, so you, you and you, we you listening? Prepare the city for an attack. And you, over here. I want you to write to Uther in Chusis. If the Angles bypass Londinium and go out into the provinces, it will be his responsibility to raise an army and stop them. If he has any questions, he can ask me in writing only. Of course, it would not be a port assault without the classic port assault opening strategy. Send the ships to find the enemy's commander and try and take him down while he's still seasick. Unfortunately, the second of the two ships I sent got a little bit stuck grinding against the first, so we only attacked with half the marines I wanted to at first. Eventually, they'll make their way around to join this fight, but half the marines might be enough. The Nordic General's bodyguard is a particularly poor one, and only two of my marines missed the ship on the jump, so we'll have quite a lot of troops on board the ship to do the fighting. Now about 20 seconds later, somewhere in this mess, we do kill the enemy general. So that's an absolutely amazing star that will change the rest of the battle into something that's possible to win. They do have three commanders, of course, in this fight because it's three armies coming in, but at least we've got the first one taken down. So all these early troops coming in are now going to be dispirited because they somehow hear of the death of their general, which reduces their morale. Plus, of course, they're just using their cavalry to attack on their own, which is uh, another classic thing to happen in Port Assault and, of course, doesn't work. Now, the Marines, I sent them to try and find the second enemy officer coming in with the reinforcements. And uh, although I did manage to find him, for some reason, their ships just kind of bounced off the enemy boat. Normally, when you touch the enemy boat, it forces them to stop so you can board them. But this time, something much more realistic happened. The enemy just sailed away and didn't let us board them. So uh, it makes sense, but it's unfortunate. Very uh, taken 
the back to see this actually happen in the game because it's going to ruin my strategy now. Especially because nearby the enemy have missile ships which are now bombarding the floundering marines. So I tried once again to catch up with the enemy commander, but I had to sail right by all these enemy archers and they just absolutely peppered the marines with arrows and the leading unit here is routing because of that unfortunately. So it looks like the enemy commander is going to get away with it here. With the second unit of marines I thought well we might as well just jump on board the archer ship and take them out rather than sail by it and have the same fate as the first unit. So at least that's a very easy melee for our marines to win and we'll take that unit out of the fight. A little bit of the fight is going on in the actual town as yet more cavalry have appeared to make single attacks where they'll definitely lose, so that's kind of them. And they also had onagers coming in as reinforcements, a nice powerful unit for a siege, but our cavalry outside the city quickly dealt with them because the enemy did not defend them. So what the enemy fleet does is basically form a giant line here. They want to all get into position so they can all land at the same time, which is a good idea, but they have so many ships they actually can't do it. So it causes a bit of delay as the AI tries to deal with the situation and get a formation that will be able to land, and they end up landing in waves, but the first wave is going to be the biggest. They did have some troops that landed already in advance, and this unit of Levy was trying to take one of my towers, and I thought I probably can stop it with a cavalry unit, even though the enemy is a speed unit, because it's such a weak one. So we simply rear-charged them with a nice volley of javelins as well, and they shatter instantly as the cavalry connect. Those guys were already worried because they'd lost their commander, of course, so that made that extra easy. So that saves the tower to fire at the rest of the enemy army as they come in, and it's now landing. All those war dog units you can see are going to be so useless. They're just a really light infantry unit without their dogs but they also do have some decent units in tow they've got high quality axe and pretty decent spear units as well that are probably better than ours especially cost efficiency wise because they have quite a lot of them now they send a few units in to fight with us and of course we'll just do the classic strategy for the second phase of a port assault battle which is let them come in and then cavalry rear attack the units and that works pretty well. The situation in which that doesn't work is when there are so many enemy units that you can't hit the back of the unit fighting at the front because there's such a big queue of enemies and there's a big risk of that happening here since the enemy have such a gigantic numerical advantage. I don't help myself very much with this little sequence where some of the advanced enemies who came around the side of the town's defences I thought well I'll use the cavalry to take out those war dogs who are on their own and then try and draw that second unit of war dogs in while these swordsmen keep the enemy spearmen here busy and this doesn't work at all because all the units just turn back to fight with my swordsmen including this unit coming in on the flank so that's not very nice so I thought well I'll just quickly pull back to my defensive position but that does not work as I mentioned in the last episode actually we literally lose two thirds of the unit in about two seconds and they break because it counts as a rear attack you cannot withdraw from combat so you have to commit luckily I had a reserve unit that can take the plate of them so we're not going to get outflanked there but not very nice to just suddenly lose one of our best units immediately like that and look at this the main bulk of the enemy's attack is actually being covered on its flanks by other units that are coming and facing outwards. I have never ever seen the AI do this, so I was very surprised because that's actually exactly what they should do if they are going to commit to sending every single unit on the same attack point. They should at least defend the flanks of that attack point so I can't exploit them too much for it. And uh, unfortunately for them, some of the units defending the flanks were only Nordic bands, so I got rid of one, but they quickly reinforced the position and I had to cool off my attack. So looks like we can't rear attack this big blob of enemies and we're probably not going to fight our way through all these guys anytime soon and the settlements burning down reducing our stats this is not going as planned the relative mystery of the Britannian Romans to the people of the Eastern Empire made them apprehensive about the sudden arrival of Constans and his legions his immediate claims to be their leader fell on deaf ears for in general the people expected their Emperor to appear and replace him at any moment but the alliance between Eastern Rome and Britannia was far less substantial than they were assuming, and Constans could easily argue that perhaps they already had an emperor. After all, he was joint consul of the two most venerated cities in the empire, and their former owners were nowhere to be seen. They would have to do what he said in the meantime, especially if they hoped to see the rest of their lands retaken by someone who at least spoke their language. Thanks so much for watching, Constans will have to cling on to Constantinopolis and Aurelianus is going to do something with the new powers he's been given as consul in the next episode of Fields of Mars.